<laughs> okay, so I am pleased to welcome everybody here to the 5G panel. This is something that's a bit new. We don't normally have panels at ITA, and so I'm pleased that Alan um, encouraged me to, to help uh, put this panel together here. And after only about 200 emails on everything from you know, the composition of the panel, making sure the panel you know, agrees to, to, be, to do what we wanted them to do, which actually is very challenging, to even things like the subtle details of the cartoon that uh, I requested that he have made, especially for the panel themselves. Now, I, I was um, asked to tell the panel the following here. We have different versions of this cartoon here for everybody on a, a piece of uh, a plaque so that everyone is in the 5G category there. So don't feel like you're you know, stuck over here in 1G times, <laughs> Ronaldo. Uh, <laughs> and uh, anyway, so I thought that was, was very cool here. And so uh, you know, this, this panel is not about me. I'm just here to make sure that we finish vaguely on time here. So I wanted to give, to start off with, my five challenges on um, the challenges for 5G panelists. And so first of all, everyone, uh, this was actually the biggest challenge ahead of time, was getting everyone to commit to one grand challenge. And some people, uh, it's not clear if they did or not, but I'm hoping that every one of you will at least at some point say during what you're gonna say, this is my grand challenge. Um, and of course, it's fine to highlight other challenges as well. Please stay within your allotted time because we don't have a huge amount of time here. Uh, and remember that your allotted time is roughly five minutes for talking, five minutes for questions among the panelists, maybe the audience, depending on how much time we have. Uh, third, stay within your allotted time. And fourth, uh, this is something that you have to be mindful of is the, the CAN phone here. It, the SNR is very low, so speak loudly and, and clearly here. So I'm gonna wear the, the CAN phone here so you all remember I'm the moderator here during the whole session here. Now, I'm gonna start off here with, with very quick introductions of the panelists here. The panelists, uh, I think, need no introduction, but Having said that, now I have to do the introduction again, <laughs> as always. Uh, so first of all, our, our first uh, panelist here actually was um, already introduced yesterday. This is Matt Grob, Executive VP at Qualcomm and CTO. And he's been working in, in wireless for a good uh, 20 plus years now, starting with 1XDVO and CDMA data, and is now in charge of various and sundry things like Qualcomm Research and Qualcomm Ventures and a uh, whole bunch of other things. And, and one of the, the real pioneers over there in wireless data. Uh, so our second panelist is Pei Ying Zhu from uh, Huawei Technologies. He's a senior director there and a Huawei fellow. Uh, Pei Ying's also been working in, in wireless quite a long time and um, particularly notable for a lot of early work on MIMO OFDM at uh, Nortel at the time. And she's been involved with a lot of standards, especially in, in multi-hop and WiMAX LTE beyond uh, LTE. Third panelist, this, this is uh, sort of fun here. This is Professor Paul Raj, who was actually my uh, PhD advisor. So it's nice that I'm on the other side for once. Um, I don't think it'll make any difference at all. Uh, but uh, he, he's considered the, the father of MIMO, has won uh, numerous awards, including the, the Marconi Award last year in 2014, as well as the Alexander Graham Bell Medal, and is elected to an astounding eight national academies in engineering and science. And uh, just as an aside, this is actually his retirement from the Navy, he has been doing, becoming a professor and doing all of this stuff here after, after a long career in the Navy, so that's it's impressive here. Uh, so our fourth panelist here, Ali Karelaila, and so he has been involved with wireless also for a good um, close to 20 years here, and is heavily involved right now in, in IoT, um, and unlicensed access, and he's on advisory board at Stanford, and, and NYU has, has done tons of patents and has, has been involved with various aspects of standardization here. And, and one interesting thing here is that he, he is actually a former professor, so I'm hoping that he can relate to what he does now with, with what we are, are all doing here, hopefully. And finally, uh, we have uh, Ronaldo Valenzuela. If, if you've been any se in any session yesterday or today where he was there, you already have been introduced to him uh, through his several questions. Um, during every talk, in the middle of the talk, sometimes at the beginning of the talk. And, uh, and so, of course, he's the Valenzuela and the Sala Valenzuela model. Uh, I was pointing that out to someone yesterday, and, and, and they thought it was, oh, that was, that was him. You know, it, was, it was really exciting here. Uh, he's an IEEE fellow, Bell Labs fellow, WWRF fellow, 
and has re received several awards, and, and he's been um, you know, notable for a lot of early work in, in propagation and, of course, now in, in various aspects of, of MIMO communication. And, and it's great to have Ronaldo on the panel because he's willing to challenge any idea, and also having him on the panel keeps him from asking so many questions in the audience so we get uh, <laughs> a little more time for the panel themselves. Okay, and so with that, um, so the plan is I'm going to invite the, the panelists up to tell us about their grand challenge, and then we're going to discuss that challenge um, among the, the panel here. So with that, I'd like to invite Matt to come on up here and tell us a little bit about your grand challenge. Okay. Yeah, I'll give you this here if you like, but All try right. to speak in the mic there. All right. Let me see if it comes up here. Okay, thanks. By the way, it's, I'm honored and, and humbled to be uh, on this panel. And uh, excited to tell you about our challenge. Uh, I want to acknowledge uh, John Spee and the audience there who actually runs our 5G program um, with a lot of thinking and input on, on this. Um, and also just want to mention from the cartoon, I, I still like 2G and 3G and 4G quite, quite a bit. <clears throat> so before, before I go through this slide, um, I, want, I want you to think a little bit about uh, what a modem does and where it's placed, and that's going to be the central theme of this challenge, is the, the architecture of a wireless network. No big surprise. If you think of a modem, in particular the one that's in a piece of infrastructure in a base station, uh, it's got RF samples coming in, uh, I and Q uh, per antenna, at some high speed with some number of bits, six, six eight bits, four, six bits of, of resolution, and then out the other side comes they're either demodulated symbols or decoded user bits, and that's at a much lower rate than the samples coming in. So if you look at the transfer function of the whole box, the whole modem, it has a lot more bits coming in one side than coming out the other. And for that reason, traditionally, it had a certain placement in the network, which was fairly close to where the antenna was, because it costs a lot to get bits to, to the modem. And the, the purpose of this grand challenge is to the placement of these functions in the network and understand uh, what are the trade-offs. And in particular, um, we've got a figure here. OK. If you look at this diagram on the left, uh, it's been pushed to one extreme where the baseband modem is now centralized. And then you have what we call front hall, and then RF, and RF goes over the air to all these users. So in some sense, this is maybe the best you can achieve from a performance standpoint if you have an infinite amount of bandwidth with low latency and you're able to get all this feedback and do all this processing in a giant central brain, uh, you can do really well. The other extreme is something that we've developed a lot lately, which is distributed small cells, where now you've got a cell with the baseband and the RF in it at the edge and the, the wireless links are talking to all the users. And the, now we, we call this now the backhaul. It's really, you know, just a term. Front hall because it's going to the RF. Backhaul because it's already post the modem. But in either case, it's just a data link that you have to pay for. So these are two extremes. And, it, and so you can think of it as a, as a spectrum uh, of architectural choices and the farther you go this way, the less coordination you have and perhaps the less requirement you have on your front hall. So this is, this is a big topic. I mean, the, it's not a new topic, but it's really central to 5G when you have centralized, when you have a dense area, you can have centralized processing and you can place the modem function at different points between the cell site, the RF, and back it deeper into the network. If it's deeper into the network, then you're allowed to do joint processing. You can get data from, from the channel feedback from all the users, and you can make some joint decision. And the question is, what is the right choice? Based on information theory and fundamental underpinnings, what are the best results? So the challenge here is to produce capacity and performance results of these different architectures subject to constraints. You don't have infinite backhaul. You don't have infinite processing. You don't have zero latency available all the time. And so given those constraints, what is the best choice? And that actually is the, the grand challenge here. Um, it's something that impacts, uh, you know, my, my friends here from Huawei and Ericsson 
Uh, you see a lot of startups doing different kinds of joint processing, um, and they all, all those techniques require the modem to be pulled back in, therefore increasing the backhaul or front haul costs. And the question is, holistically, uh, what is the right and best and complete set of results uh, with, with those constraints? That's the challenge. All right, thank you. It's very interesting. Mike working here. So just before, hey, before you go up there here, so let's, let's, uh, I want to get some reactions from the panel here. So <clears throat> what did y'all think here? Is there anything controversial here? Something interesting to say? I mean, Huawei and Erickson, you both were called out here, I felt like. So well, let's see your response here. I, I think I totally agree with uh, Matt. This is uh, one of the biggest uh, challenges there. Although I, I think, uh, uh, this is not unique for 5G. Uh, we have been dealing with this in 4G also. Uh, but I guess uh, in 5G, we kind of uh, can uh, look at this from uh, the beginning, and uh, we can uh, probably do a better job than the uh, 4G generation. Okay, anyone else? Uh, yeah, I think, the, I think as an information theory crowd here, we tend to get too enamored with the centralized solution uh, because of all the good news. Uh, but Wait, which we? That's the we of us or the we of you? Even us, even as the uh, hidden information theorist at Ericsson. Uh, but the, the, the issue is that the, you know, the front hole and back hole and all that stuff is very uneven. So you cannot just postulate it and say it should be like this and then go for it. So I think what Matt mentioned about putting constraints and so on uh, is going to make it a very interesting and messy problem. Okay. Ronaldo? Yeah, uh, a comment. Uh, the trade-off is amazingly complex. There are many layers when you start uh, particularly looking at resource allocation, scheduling, ARQ, and all of that. Uh, and on top of that, I think it's interesting to consider that perhaps there's not a single answer. There are applications where cost may be paramount, and then you get a really inexpensive solution close to the edge, and then low bid, low bid rate to the network. There are other solutions where perhaps it's more efficient to do everything virtualized and in the cloud, and, but this may not meet uh, latency requirements of some jet other type of uh, applications and deployment scenarios. So I think it's, it's an amazing challenge, and one that perhaps to make progress in the COM theory, information theory, is helpful to pick a particular application slash deployment scenario and break it breaking it down into workable working spaces. Okay, thank you. Anyone else have any comments? I'll just make a small comment. Yeah. No, I think uh, Matt uh, uh, really uh, uh, nailed an important issue. Uh, what I would also say is, of course, uh, this whole area is being driven by cost. Cost is really the, what's driving it. But, uh, uh, but this raises some important questions that Matt uh, talked about. Because some of the issues here, some of the uh, the uh, trade-offs are not very clear because they're not necessarily competing resources. For example, the access band channels um, uh, spectrum is much lower versus uh, the backhauls, or it could be even be fiber. So it's an interesting, uh, complicated problem. <clears throat> okay, excellent. Well, it's good good discussion here. So Pei Ying, I'd like to invite you up to give us your grand challenge. You see that the pressure is going to keep increasing as we keep going down the table here. So, so just click the next page. Or use the remote there. So, yep. Yep, that's you. Ah, okay. It's different. All right. Okay. So, uh, I mean, like, uh, if you, you have attended a previous... Uh, 5G panel, you probably already know, uh, you know, people talk about the, uh, what 5G is for, you know, uh, the, the main uh, issue is that uh, 5G will need to support uh, many different applications and so on. Now, uh, the problem with uh, the information theory is that uh, we, we, we got this uh, trapped by this uh, famous uh, Shannon, uh, Shannon capacity. So even internally, when we try to uh, study 5G, there's so many voices about the you know, physical layer is dead, there's nothing you can do, we already reached the Shannon capacity. So 
the, uh, this, this really actually put a lot of uh, challenge even for us to start this uh, research for 5G. Though. So one of the things I really would like to see uh, from the uh, Information Theory Society is uh, to, to study the fundamental theoretical analysis to provide the framework for the, for the uh, capacity analysis or system design trade-off under the constraints of the uh, latency we, we don't have uh, unlimited time to, to send the data, uh, especially now 5G required like uh, absurd uh, low latency, like you're talking about the less than a millisecond. Right? And also the reliability. Uh, we actually, uh, typically we, we don't really uh, uh, care that much about the reliability. We rely on the high bear Q, uh, ACK, NAC to, to increase the reliability. But uh, now it seems 5G want to venture into the high reliability and the low latency application. So what is the theory behind that? What is the trade-off? And also, in the past, we always uh, study this, uh, uh, suppose that the data source is unlimited, a uh, uh, huge amount of data source, or, or we, we, we don't have any packet size limit. But in reality, we always send the very small, short packet, and uh, the, the, the traffic pattern is, is not, uh, you know, it's, it's, it's a different type of traffic model. So really, I, I, I like to see is the, the theoretical analysis uh, to, to guide us to, to see what we can do uh, for the 5G under the uh, constraints. Of course, uh, Matt is talking about the uh, you know, constraint for the topologics, and uh, this is uh, additional on top of that. Uh, then the other thing is uh, we seem to uh, uh, talking about the huge capacity, huge data rate, and so on. Uh, we, we're kind of hoping that we will get the uh, huge amount of spectrum, but the reality is we, we didn't get that much. You know, if you look at the outcome of uh, this uh, WIC 15, uh, we, we, we pretty much we have to rely on what we have. We, we get a little bit additional spectrum, but we don't get that much. So. So we need to actually make the um, much more e e e spectrum efficiency. We still need to work on this uh, classical problem. And uh, I, my challenge is that we need to find the mechanism uh, without increased antenna and the site density. Because uh, the issue with increased antennas and increased site density is really the, the cost issue. Uh, we studied the MIMO many, many years ago. We know the MIMO theory, but what do we do? We, we still have two antennas, basically. All right, now, now summarize yeah. your grand challenge here. Wh which of these is your challenge? Yeah, yeah, yeah. The first one is my, my, my biggest the one. Logic. But it's, it's essentially we, we need the theory under the practical constraints. But, but I mean, yeah. you know, I think this is a theme that's going to come up again and again. I mean, yeah. do you want something as simple as Shannon's expression that includes all the practical constraints, or do you want an expression that includes all the constraints that has to be evaluated via a supercomputer? Would that be okay? No, no, or no, no, no. You want a Actually, simple... Actually, uh, the, the, the thing is, uh, of course, we do the evaluation, you know, we, we do the simulations, right? Uh, under the various constraints, then you can give the infinite amount of the answers. Yeah based on your simulation assumption. But we, have, we need to have something uh, which can reduce the effort for us to do this uh, simulation. And also, uh, you kind of have a certain uh, guidance in terms of uh, or bounds. We, what we need is, a, is, a, is kind of a, a sim simple uh, theory, but with certain bounds so that we actually can work <laughs> Along with. <laughs> okay, that's. Uh, yeah, it, yes. it's not. I, I don't know how to express it. But it's just. Uh, it's not as as easy as uh, you know. Yeah. Uh, previous well, I think I, I, I think people understand that here, and I think that's. Uh, yeah, uh, it's the real not challenge is getting it simple. Though, but uh, like taking example, actually a few years ago, uh, you know, Mobile VC actually did a study on the fundamental capacity limit. I personally, I think it's it's a actually very interesting study. But somehow, there is no follow-up on that. Uh, you know, it, it, there was a study on this, even this uh, joint, uh, you know, centralized processing and so on. Uh, so I, I still like to see 
more uh, study in that direction to tell us uh, how dense, even, even, even you increase the density, we, we need to understand okay. how dense, and you, you increase the antenna, you need to understand what is the practical limit. That okay, let me, let me get some reactions from the panel here. Um, I don't know, Matt, do you want sure. to start off? So, um, well, I sure, I sure think these are the right questions to ask. In fact, the, the fundamental capacity, it's something we're all always asking and always searching for. And we all want to know how much gas is in the tank, well, how much gas is left in the tank. And uh, we don't have all those answers. I mean, we, you, can, you can sit down and, and design a cellular network and compute the capacity and study the antennas and you get these results. And, and then you suddenly realize, oh, well, that's assuming that all the data is going from the phones into the network. And sometimes some of the data goes from the phone to another phone and you could do it a different way and the topology could change. And so there's still uh, a lot of unanswered questions. And um, I think that, uh, you know, I'm very optimistic that there's still a lot of improvement to be added. So this, this search is exactly uh, what's needed. This is what we all want to know. Okay. All right. Yeah. Ali? Um, yes. Uh, just to be a little bit controversial here. All right. Some controversy. Yes. yes. Uh, I'm not sure we care so much about what the capacity is. We care much more oh, about how no. you have techniques <laughs> that, can, that can approach capacity. So in that sense... Uh, you know, I think sometimes we are missing out on the insights that, uh, you know, capacity theorems or whatever the hell they are, are helping wow. us understand how to get there. I think hmm. capacity is fine, but I think we need to get inspiration from how you get there. Well, which will I, help us do it. I don't know that a lot of those results have told us how to get there. I mean, I'm not sure. You know, we, we, there's probably, be, you know, more information theorists in the audience to comment on that. Uh, would you like to say yeah, something, I, sir? You know, um, uh, Shan's theory for point-to-point -point links I might have kind of spoiled us because once you started complicating things in the, in the networks, we have, we have very well posed problems for which we don't have answers uh, still. When we start throwing in more dimensions, uh, like we're all trying to do, I'm not really sure if we can really ask uh, crisp questions like, uh, crisp, uh, look, look for crisp uh, answers like we, we have done before. Maybe the way we approach that problem has to be completely different. Obviously, we want this theory to inform practice in some form, but whether it comes back as a, like a capacity or a gap to a capacity, that may be too ambitious. Mm. That's a good comment. Ronaldo, anything final to say? No? Okay, all right. Okay, thank you. Mr. Farosh, would you like to say a few things? Press right in it. Yeah. Just press the space one. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, one more. Oh, wait. What happened here? I'll go forward and then come back. No, hold on here. Yeah, I just. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> okay, Rob. So this is. This is a tough panel. Uh, you know, it's sometimes easier to find answers than to ask the right questions. And I'm reminded of a story. Uh, Rob mentioned I was in the Indian Navy for many, many years. And I was once building, uh, running a very large uh, sonar project, anti submarine sonar. And I happened to meet the Indian Prime Minister uh, to brief her on that project. Uh, it was important for the country. And she was in a very bad mood. So I was telling her about all the solutions we have found. She, she shut me up saying, Captain, I'm not interested in answers. I want to know whether you know the answer the questions. <clears throat> so questions, asking the right questions is difficult. So, so let me make a, a, a small attempt. So 5G, I think, services is all about you know mass, uh, you know uh, 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 telematics, uh, uh, very high, uh, uh, very high speed uh, uh, connectivity to virtual reality, uh, also IoT, and so on and so forth. It's really a or to use the naval, parad uh, naval term, all singing, all dancing ship may be hard to build. But the performance issues that are coming up are things like where, how do you get power down, low power, latency is very important, throughput or capacity, which is usually the thing we focus on, reliability, which uh, my previous speaker spoke to, which I think is really important, and connectivity or massive connectivity, how do you support that in a nice way. So, so typically, so far, network information theory largely focuses on a uh, on, uh, big focus on throughput. So capacity, where itself, you know, it's hard, it's, uh, it's not answered me even very simple questions. 
uh, because once you bring in networks, so you have problems of interference, you have cooperation, all these things complicate life immen immensely. But nevertheless, even the, what answers we have is really largely around the throughput problem. But I think uh, it'd be nice, like both my previous speakers alluded, we want to have a larger focus around everything. And that, I was just saying earlier, may be uh, too much of a mountain to climb. So whether we should approach it in terms of exact answers or you know, approach it in a different way is not clear to me. But I think uh, framing the whole issue properly, I think, is a grand challenge itself. So that is my first two cents. Then I want to talk a little bit about uh, all the failed problems I had as a, as a research supervisor. So, you know, one thing that uh, uh, we all exploit is uh, state now, knowledge of state of knowledge of flow uh, in a network. And uh, for example, if you have current knowledge of like, like channel state, for example, uh, which requires, often requires, unfortunately, communication bandwidth because that's the resource we need to feedback. We do that in LTE. And that can affect many things to make things better. But another thing which I was trying to get students, my students to look at, but uh, they never really properly did, uh, we wrote a couple of papers, was to, if you have past history of the state, uh, uh, can you use that in, uh, and, and the cost for that is memory, because that's resource you use memory, memory is really cheap. Can you do good things with it? And an example, for example, is in the, the right bottom picture, you have a relay network where, where signal jumps across from one to the next node in time slot one, and your, uh, and your uh, uh, victim node listens to that, that, that transmission. Now, once again, the, that same, the same packet jumps to another node and again interferes with the victim node. But since you listened to it earlier, you know, you have prior information. So if you have a lot of memory of what happened earlier, you may be able to use it in the system. How do you formalize this problem and, and do a better job? Uh, you know, we wrote a couple of papers, but I think, this, I think there's more to be done there. And about the, uh, if you have, uh, you know, knowledge of all the cues in the system, uh, you really have some understanding of what the future is going to look like, because these this cues had to get filled out and move out. And, and, and then I think you really get involved with lots of scheduling problems, and the resource for that is computation. And to me, uh, we kind of looked at the top row uh, of channel state information, but really not looked at the past and future issues more, more, uh, more clearly. Uh, I would actually call the slide the, a, a failed slide in the sense that we never, uh, my group never properly focused on the last two areas. And finally, uh, uh, this really goes back to Matt's uh, comments. Uh, uh, you know, if you look at all the buzzwords are out right now today, uh, uh, we tend to focus a lot on multiple access, waveforms, coding, modulation, MIMO, and this is, uh, all these things are changing in, in 5G. Everything here is being sort of revamped because of IoT and, uh, you know, very high bandwidths. Uh, none of the old LTE uh, solutions really work anymore. So that's being looked at. There's things like COMP and HetNet and uh, carry aggregation, ICIC. But uh, there are other things happening like UC, uh, user plane and control plane splitting, or SDN, where you are sort of moving the control plane outside the system and centralizing it. Uh, Cloud RAN, which actually uh, Matt talked about a lot. Virtualization, uh, multi-link integration. All these things also, I think, are part of the broader framing of the system. So I don't have a good, uh, good. I'm not, I'm not doing uh, Rob's instructions very well. I'm talking about a single point. But I do think there's some very, very uh, broad questions to be answered. But I do, I somehow feel that uh, it can't be approached by we have, we've approached Shannon capacity. We have to find a different way of looking at these problems. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. So can we pin you down on one grand challenge or? <laughs> you see, well, I have I, no flexibility I, I would here. pick up, we have pick up one in a, I would think, like for example, reliability in 5G where you're trying to sort of, let's say, you're operating a remotely a crane, we've got to make sure that link actually works all the time. And reliable today is normally supported by microscopic diversity or perhaps macroscopic, but here you may need other forms in the multi-link, multi-channel type ideas. So, uh, so reliable is going to be very important. How does, how, how does that interact with everything else in the system? It would be an interesting problem. I don't think we really looked at it properly so far. Okay. So any, any reactions from the panel here? 
Yeah, actually, uh, to that point, uh, what we really like to understand is, uh, is there some uh, theory which can tell us if I want to achieve a certain reliability, what is the cost for us there? Because in the end, for 5G to be viable to support this reliable service, we need to figure out how much the, the, the cost there, because we trade the, uh, the, the spectrum for this reliability. Currently, there's no, no guidance. To but, yeah. So there's a lot of discussion about things like cost. I mean, what, what is cost, like to, to, for us information theorists? No, like if, uh, to me, okay, the cost is uh, people pay huge amount for spectrum, right? Well, yeah, so if you, if, you, yeah. if you spend uh, lots of resources for me to provide uh, one particular service to in order to reach certain reliability, it's not doable, basically. Uh, so we have to understand whether it's feasible, even the feasibility part. Now, we, we, of course, we can build a system to, to make it uh, as reliable, but uh, hmm. I, I don't know what is, uh, like, uh, is there some theory we can uh, kind of predict to, to reach certain, actually, even the theory to define the reliability is, is, okay. is, is, is a question there. All right, Ali? Uh, yeah, w one thing about this uh, ultra-reliable uh, use cases, which we have all talked about at various times, is that they, 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 you're going to have to pay with, for it with uh, reduced capacity. And th that is kind of going against everything we have been doing the past 10, 15 years. But, but are you? I mean, isn't that the whole point of developing this theory is to see, do you have to pay? So, so I, I think, exactly, I think the, okay, the, the information theory... Uh, insights in that case is like, if you really want reliable, ultra-reliable communication, which we have defined in various ways, and maybe we need to define more, uh, what are you going to pay for it? Because you can't get it free. I mean, you can't have everybody else at 10% block error rate, and these guys at 10 to the minus 9, and say, oh, it's okay, no, nothing happened. So I think there's, there's some very complicated things going on there. Okay. So, my personal opinion, to be constructive, <laughs> remove the word cost and price. I think applied mathematicians, which in a broad sense I hope uh, is what we are here, and that hat for now, and most of you full time, uh, the most valuable thing is to understand fundamental trade-offs. And I don't know that uh, cost is fundamental, price is fundamental. However, hertz, power, latency, milliseconds. So if we understand the fundamental trade-offs, I think we're way ahead. And then business people, deployment uh, operators and vendors can figure out what point in that curve they want to you know, bet their dollars on or kronos or whatever it is. Okay, Ali, would you like to go up and give us some comments? Or you have to go back. You have to go back. Slides. Let's try to do that. Yeah, just click the back button. Yeah, there you go. All right. Okay, uh, so uh, just fair warning, there's a... Uh, I have some stuff about the uh, security of information theorists at the end. I will let you stare at it for a second when I'm done. Security. So, a so <laughs> my, my challenge is uh, the IoT challenge, as I call it. Uh, so, you know, as many of the talks you have seen in the past day or more uh, tell you, you know, we're going from the, say, 4G networks, which were dominated by smartphones, which have pretty even uh, performance capabilities, into the IoT world, where in addition to the, you know, mobile broadband that, that everybody wants, you have all kinds of devices. Some of them have very high reliability requirements and so on, and I'm not worried about those because we basically know how to handle them. But on the complete other side of the spectrum, we have very simple devices, like sensors and actuators and so on, and they're going to be in the billions and tens of billions. And uh, we are not really set up to deal with them because, we, you know, as an industry, uh, I think I can say that we have been doing an extremely good job at riding the, the, the capabilities of the electronics industry. We're their best customers. You know, we, we, we buy the best stuff. We do the best networks, etc. We make the best phones. And now we're saying, now you have this tiny little device that can barely function, and we want to integrate it into the network. So I think this is kind of some really strange times for us. Uh, so, so at the same time, I think as others have mentioned, uh, we're still dealing with the very extreme uh, spectrum scarcity, no matter what they tell us. 
I mean, we, we, as an industry, I don't think we have been really aggressive enough in demanding our spectrum. I think the, like the, our close cousin, the Wi-Fi industry, has done a better job in a sense. Uh, so spectrum is going to still be the, the resource, and we're going to have to do, make everything else uh, constrained by spectrum. So the challenge here, in a way, is like extreme network asymmetry. You're going to have big devices, small devices, so on. And to handle these, in particular, these small devices that I'm worried about, we're, are we able to move the complexity over to the infrastructure side to compensate for the fact that these tiny devices don't do much, right? While we're worrying about capacity and energy and everything else. Okay, so some just to kind of break it down, some suggestions. Uh, so for example, if you have many, many billions of devices and they all have something to say, uh, so for example, suppose you have like temperature devices or pollution devices or something like that. Can you sample them in some, some new and interesting way like compressive sensing or something like that and get enough and randomly sample another set later and so on, just as a way to prevent them from overwhelming the network? Uh, another thing is like now you have this very wide range of performance. You have some very high-end devices that do MIMO and all kinds of wonderful stuff and interference cancellation and all that. And then you have the device that barely has an antenna and it cannot do processing and, uh, and so on. So do you put them all in, in one spectrum? Are you supposed to segregate them? Do you treat them the same? Do you treat them different? I think we, we, we don't really know how to do that. Uh, even kind of designing the air interface itself, like we, we've been talking about 5G a lot today. Uh, you may have some exceedingly simple devices and their receivers don't do coding. Which, like, okay, so what do we do then, right? How do we, how do we compensate for either extremely simple coding or no coding? Right? So that, that, that's not how we do information theory. Uh, uh, even like things that I don't quite understand, it, authentication, for example, if you have a device uh, that can barely identify itself, it has a few bits and then you have billions of them, so they all have the same name, right? So how do you know which is which? Can you, can you rely on the neighbors to kind of vouch for it, say, yes, we know him, he's from the neighborhood, etc. So that could be a very interesting uh, information theory type question, and, and, and so on. And uh, just, uh, this is what I promised you. Uh, my, my kid has told me, knowing that I was coming to this conference, that the, the, the philosophers are angry with us. Apparently, we have disembodied information theory and uh, we sold our soul to the devil and so on, and it all started with Shannon, so be careful around philosophers out there. <laughs> this, is, this is a real quote. Okay, that, that co I think I need a little time. Thank you. All right, so just as a quick recap, what, what was your grand challenge? So my grand challenge is how do you have the very simple devices in, in the network that has to worry about capacity and cost and so on. But I mean, where is the simplicity of the device and information theory? I mean, you tell me. Oh, okay. Uh, hmm. That was a good one. Uh, panel reactions? Sure. Matt. So, um, well, I certainly agree. We, we have to complain more about getting more spectrum. And there's never enough. So but, you need to complain more. All right. But, I uh, got that one. Be more, have a louder voice. <laughs> But I'll challenge the challenge in one way, which is the, the notion of a very simple device. Um, I think, <laughs> I'm again looking at it from, a, from Qualcomm eyes, I guess, but uh, you have to look at the device. There's, if you're going to make it so simple that it can't even decode or know its ID, you have to ask the question, if I put a little bit more complexity in there, uh, which I can do with, with, with almost no cost in the future, or even the present, does that, does that help the overall situ situation enough to make it worth doing? And so, so I'll, I just challenge the challenge a little bit under the premise that the, the, the end devices are very simple. They do have to, they are very numerous in this scenario, very low cost, but I think we could again study as part of your proposal or your challenge where that complexity should go. Um, moving it across one side of the link or the other uh, is something to, to be studied and, and, and balanced. Yeah, very good point. I think the theme of uh, trade-offs versus just optimizing for a particular ultra-low cost or, or mission critical is, is becoming a, a thread I'll, I'll be interested in pursuing. Uh, I'll just talk about IoT. I thought the, uh, you know, silicon really is uh, virtually zero cost today. 
uh, it's really, I think, I, I think the gating issue is power. Power is what determines everything. Right. So, I mean, what, you know, IoT, we've seen a lot about IoT, and um, it's one of those buzzwords that, like, my dad might send me something about it. Oh, this is really cool. But, uh, I mean, wh where is the, really the information theory with IoT? I mean, it's just a lot of devices, the usual stuff. I mean, is it complexity-constrained information theory? I mean, what, what do you think? Give us, a, like, a hint on a way forward here. So, the, oops. So, what... Matt just questioned, which was my premise, is that, is that they have to be simple. I mean, if you really go, go you know, full on and you have like a hundred of these sensors in this room, they, they, you really have to bring the, the cost down. And of course, you know, we, we're, we're riding this wave of cheaper and better electronics, so you can always make them better. But if you, if you take the vision that people have of how many they want and how they're just going to throw them around without really designing them in the right places, there will be some uh, constraints on their capabilities. And so my challenge is, can you handle devices with low capabilities? OK. All right. So we need to make a theory that uh, allows for that. OK. All right. Ronaldo, do you want to? Well, this uh, really uh, falls into the yes. slides I have. So yes, please. I'll take it from take it away. Front. You have to go through a few slides there. There you go. Okay, so I'm glad you're all here, and I'm really uh, uh, appreciate the invitation, Robert, to come to this panel. This is very inspiring conference, and really uh, it opens the mind to see what uh, mathematics and clever people can do uh, when you let them loose. We heard some fascinating talks about folding paper, about genomes, about evolution. I'm very glad to be here. Thanks for the invitation. Now, in terms of the grand challenge, uh, I can, I, I'd love to uh, share with you a little bit of a personal journey. Uh, as you probably know, I've been doing uh, physical layer research, wireless in particular, for some time at Bell Labs. And the question keeps coming, you know, we should just fire you guys a lot. I mean, Shannon is already done. The link layer where we did 2DBs, we heard a little bit. And so I even participated in this uh, famous or infamous paper, depend, depending on whose, whose side you are, about physical layer being dead. I, I tried forcefully to argue that it's absolutely not dead. I'm not sure whether my uh, message got across or saved, not. I think. But uh, in any case, at that time, I was making the argument that, yes, the link within the cost uh, issues, or let me not use the word cost, within the practical limitations of uh, the kind of PAs and nonlinearities that we can afford in, in cell phones, to be within 2 or 3dB of Shannon, it's pretty much closed case for the link. At the time, I would argue that when it comes to the network, we don't understand it. So network information theory, although it means different things for different people, but uh, you know, very quickly in our team, we try to answer the question, uh, how does this illuminate the simulations we do for 3GBP and standards? How far are we from the network capacity? And to be honest with you, I went through, I'm still going through a little bit of a discovery and a sobering time because you can do bounds. And you can postulate with Jerry Foschini, a mentor and dear friend, he always had the approach, let's start with everything ideal. And if we, if we see promised land with uh, orchards of magical fruits and, and uh, you know, paradise uh, music, then we go in that direction. If on the other hand, it just looks like incremental 50% better than what we have today before we put all the constraints, not, not even bother. So we looked at the, what at the time we used to call network MIMO. Full network coordination, full channel is, uh, is known everywhere, and all messages shared, everybody. You know what? It's only five times the throughput of no coordination. So this is an existentialistic uh, crisis. And where are we going? I mean, upper bound, lower bound, and you know, we've done it. You start adding channel state constraints, uh, noise, quantization, uh, delay, and your time five between no coordination starts shrinking. So we have upper bound, we have lower bounds. At this point, the 5G discussion comes and saves the day. Because really, it's about breaking the box, redefining the problem. If we have long file transfers, and we have uh, uh, you know, hexagonal networks, I would argue perhaps you know, uh, it's time to look somewhere else. Now, 
We could still say, well, look, but uh, for your upper bound, dirty paper coding is the capacity achieving. We don't have codes that can implement your you know, very high order lattices. So yes, I could very easily, and I think it would resonate with you, put that as my challenge. But it didn't, because it's what I call one of those hardened problems. I think it was very popular 10, 15 years ago, and then very hard to make progress. So a lot of minds have struggled with it and not gotten anywhere. You can take it from the lower bound and say, you know, uh, the interference from the other cell, which is the limiting case when you have no coordination, maybe we can treat it as the interference channel. Well, again, you would resonate with that, but you also know, why don't you, why do you tell me that? We've been trying for 40 years and we stick, I think that there's progress on the three by three network. <laughs> well, obviously, I don't want to do that. What I want to do instead is to tell you what my real uh, grand challenge is, which I think it goes by redefining the problem. Big hopes and suspension of disbelief require here. I tell you honest, nobody knows, but the classical uh, you know, YouTube video clip or a classical cellular communications with long files, we're done. And most seriously, <coughs> we're done in terms of how much money service providers can extract out of society. Every one of us knows that 140 bucks, I'm done with this. So that direction, it's getting, and, and you can view it with hard numbers. They don't tell you, they don't advertise it, but look at the uh, revenue of uh, major service providers, it's flat for the last four or five years. They make tons of money, so don't cry for them, but, but the uh, growth rate has spittered out. Now, Wall Street is very, very cruel when they see that happening. Because now you went from a growth <coughs> industry to a utility. Very different uh, valuation of your stock. But I, let's not get derailed on the economics. <laughs> yes. All right. The important thing challenge. is everybody in the industry and their tera millions of dollars floating about is banking that something new is going to explode in our faces and is going to create all sorts of new revenue. So suspension of disbelief here, and me as well as you, for a while I was sitting on the fence and saying, nah, 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 well, let's get off the nah, nah, nah. The idea is if we can do short packet, it will trans in an efficient and economic way, it will transform our lives in and simplify whether it's professional, industrial, or, or domestic, or residential, whatever it is. And at the same time, we know very little about the theory of short packet communication. I don't want to call it IoT purposely because I think the term has become a little bit uh, meaningless because it's not the same to control a $20 million mining machine uh, or uh, read your meter. I mean, so there's such vast difference of deployment scenarios. I want to focus on the massive, life-transforming, very inexpensive, but at the same time, wide area, and perhaps even mobile, uh, short packet communication. If it's short range and, and fixed, there are very good solutions for that. And don't, doesn't necessarily involve a mobile radio network. But if you are about town, if you are visiting, if you are at the uh, doctor's office, or so whatever you do when you are not in your home net, there could still be a lot of uh, medical monitoring, I don't want to go through the list. What I want to share with you, because that's the, the right uh, audience, what are the challenges? Well, there was a fascinating um, uh, session this morning. We started talking about short packet. Immediately somebody said, how long is your coding horizon? Well, how about 20 bits? Anybody wants to offer a good code for that? What are the trade-offs? Now, if we don't do coding, we pay a price. If I put 10 times overhead to do the right coding, we pay a different price. And here price is not the dollar one. I think in this community, we need to understand the trade-offs. So if you can produce the curve, if we can collectively understand these trade-offs, then we're in a much better shape to design for a particular deployment scenario. Now, what are the key hitters? Uh, media, uh, media access. Well, the metric first. We are stuck with uh, bits per second per hertz per square kilometer per hertz, I think is the angel formula that was uh, celebrated this morning. That's great, but I don't think it's quite relevant here. If the meter or the device that is uh, uh, you know, alerting to a catastrophe or, uh, or at least a fire in your home or whatever, is gonna be uh, almost ever silent 
except when there is very low probability event, uh, clearly this is not a heavy loaded network. On the other hand, you may have many orders of magnitude more of these potential endpoints. If each one of them, as today, is going to keep a session alive in some, even if it's just a database, you know, this is not going to work at some point. At the, sun, at the same time, if this guy, uh, when becomes active, it has to go through a 40 message <laughs> protocol to, to get to identify itself, uh, uh, conf confirm with the network that uh, the account is current and so on and so forth, the battery is gonna be dead before it can even set that uh, emergency actually happened. So the next point, and the maximum number of, of actual endpoints is much more important than spectral efficiency. And so this is relates immediately with the next one. Your media access needs to be totally rethought. Currently, LTE, uh, RAS channel, and not to bore you with the details, but close to 100 messages, a little less, depending on the case, 40 to 80 messages are exchanged before you can transfer data. Now, can you imagine wasting all of that energy and resources if you're a little sensor that wants to make your life happier or, 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 or more uh, uh, stable or, or uh, you know, emergency free? It just doesn't pay. Related with that, with media access, that is a very interesting trade-off that I think mathematicians would love to tackle. You can very easily postulate, like some computer uh, people do, one address for every device. Well, then you're going to have, what, 512-bit uh, address, 1,024-bit uh, you know, address to be able to really map every device. But it's pretty fast. You send this, this ID, and the network immediately knows exactly what device, in what country, in what region, et cetera. The other extreme, you just deal with 10 devices that talk to an aggregating point. And these guys have only a three bit address. But then the access point adds a few more bits to differentiate this access point from the other one. So obviously hierarchical, and you're adding bits as the packet moves through the network. What is the trade-off? But I think you get my drift. There, there are a lot of very interesting trade-offs. The, the rest are more con conventional for com theory people. Uh, except for latency, that's a tricky one, because remember, you cannot fly faster than the speed of light, which in glass it allow, allows you only a round trip of 100 kilometers uh, if your budget is one millisecond. So people who are talking millisecond latency need to understand where is your application server. But that's perhaps a topic for another discussion. And the rest are very uh, well-known power and power control issues. So with that, <laughs> understanding trade-offs. Right, a few minutes left. Thank you, Ronaldo. Any uh, comments there from the panel? I think so. So just to be clear, your challenge is short packet <laughs> communication. Okay. Right, right. But I'm really understanding the fundamental trade-offs. Okay. Among the, All right. So the I'll yeah, dimensions. yeah. What do you think here? So, so in, uh, if if you have that gateway or that agent that can at least talk to the local things, uh, do you do you, you have to give it some trust? Yes. So in your story, that, that agent is the trustworthy. Yeah. That's a very important topic because it's very tempting to say uh, that agent could be my wife I know, but do you really trust the wife I know? So you may actually engage a service provider simply because the security and trust issue that a global uh, or nationwide service provider may offer. That's an interesting thing. Do you want to pay every month for that? Maybe if it's really All right, Paul. Uh, take a dig at Ronaldo. So after saying All we right. shouldn't talk about cost, he mentioned cost on every sentence. <laughs> he tried to correct himself. Yes. Uh, I, I think uh, this is a probably similar to what I was trying to say is that when we talk about the capacity, we need to actually at least think about the capacity definition. Like in this case, uh, we shouldn't use the like, uh, bits per hertz per second. But rather, you should use the density of the, the connectivity. And uh, so, so maybe the new theory, you know, similar some channel theory, but some uh, grand theory can put this into a framework, so allow us to to evaluate it in this sense. Yeah. Yeah, I think I agree. I mean, it may help to have an evaluation framework. I, I, I'd want to reiterate that this type of communication, short packets, is, is really important. And, and a cellular network is not efficient today with the setup and teardown. However, uh, this has been thought about a lot. And it's quite elusive. I mean, there's, you know, there's folks in the, in the room here that have worked uh, for years <laughs> on, on streamlining how, how those setup and teardown procedures work and minimize the, the, the packet flow. 
So it's something uh, very important. We, we need to address it. I think when the, whatever form of IoT comes, it'll be more important. But it's, uh, it's a hard problem, and, and a lot of thought has been put in. It is true, but I would say that for the first time, there is enough motivation to uh, challenge the classical multi-message uh, access to the, uh, to the media. And now people are suggesting asynchronous access. They're also suggesting one-shot access, where you just send the packet, hopefully with enough redundancy that has a higher probability. So, it's, But it's always trade-offs. You, you increase the chance that the packet may not make it. But if it does make it, the lat latency would be very short, or the energy price would be very consumption would be very short. So I think the trade-offs are still uh, to be redefined in the light of a short packet. All right, thank you. Well, Alon, we kind of ran out of time. Do, do we have extra time, or should we wrap it up? Question from the audience, perhaps? <laughs> yeah, OK, I guess. I mean, as long as the audience is here and you know, we don't need to eat lunch. Um, so just as a, a preface, though, the, the audience question should be an actual question. And it shouldn't be a monologue, and it shouldn't be a back and forth. So just please ask a question. The V's. I have a question about the Internet of Things. OK, good. Thank you. Next. <laughs> All right, give us your question. Can IoT in, like the Internet of uh, stupid things, like with very little power, little memory, and no competent capability. But there's also the Internet of Intelligent Things, right? Uh, there's a lot of competent power in this whole. A lot of memory, a lot of communication capability with other devices. And it strikes me that uh, I mean, the challenge that you propose, we don't see that the, um, the network designer um, have the idea of exploiting such capabilities for, for the improvement of the network. Quick answer. I think the community is very much focused on the Internet of Smart Things. That's what LTE does, and it does it very well. It can do more, maybe dipping into big data available in your uh, phone and the like, and, and certainly people are thinking that, in that direction. For a uh, applied mathematician community or information theory, if I may be uh, addressing it, I think the short packet presents tremendous uh, trade-off challenges that, that we are much uh, at the beginning of understanding. Excellent. Any other comments? All right, so a question in there. Uh, so semiconductor scale of things is coming to an end, yet it seems like we want more complex scale. Is there a challenge there? Mm -hmm. Okay. Matt? Yeah, certainly there is. I mean, we want to... It may be coming to an end, but we want to push that uh, the end of that party back as far as possible, um, and uh, and look at new techniques. So, uh, but again, on the on the very small device, whether they're large or small, you still want to weigh what happens if you can add a little complexity to the device to the effect on the overall network, and place those functions on the right side of the radio, and make that choice. So we get we got to keep thinking about that, even as the silicon gets tougher, gets tougher on both sides. So you still have to make that trade-off. Any other comments on the panel? Well, I was, uh, I'm actually looking forward to all this uh, multi-core technology coming up. Uh, hopefully that, that will bring some light into the complexity okay. thing. All right, so Giuseppe, you had a question? Yes. So today is my controversial day. So controversial. All right. Why industry is so conservative? Uh, you did multi-user mind more 10 years ago and get you only five factor of five, you forget about it. And uh, you probably have not read that there is a very nice theory of uh, uh, finite length coding that exactly addresses reliability and finite length. So we can exactly pinpoint the trade-offs you were talking about. Why yeah. is it so concerned? I, I want to add to this. Actually, I didn't mention that. That is uh, precisely what I'm looking for. But that uh, top that paper actually from um, coding stuff. It's uh, it, it, we need to extend that study into the whole system, not just limited on the coding itself. Actually, that's precisely I'm uh, asking. We want to study the uh, limited uh, finer packets. What is the capacity limitation? Not just coding limitation. All right, panel, you all are accused of being too conservative, which I take it in this context is a bad thing. Well, I can share. I, I can share you my uh, personal misery. I, I have been an advocate of Mimo for since the beginning. And Mimo. And and Mimo. And uh, whether it's a single user, multi user network, or whatever form that 3 GBP loves to call it. And the harsh reality is that uh, it's a very competitive world out there, and you have 
other options. So if for a service provider, they can achieve the same doubling of capacity by buying uh, twice the spectrum or investing on you know, n times more antennas, these are serious uh, hardcore business people and they do whatever is most cost effective. And so far, adding spectrum is winning. So that's why current aggregation has become the rage. And they're moving to 3.4 and 5 and maybe 28, maybe. So maybe they we're just too far ahead of, uh, of ourselves. And when Spectrum really, really becomes in short demand, which is not today, because for this guy spending 10 billion in uh, Spectrum, remember, they make that revenue one service provider in one month. So Spectrum right. shortage? I don't believe it. All right, there's one more question, Daniela. Hey, hey, that, to be fair, that was my last question, but all right, fine, you can have it. Yes, so, so you want to know how much money they're willing to put in? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, NSF is funding all this stuff. Yet you all came and, and said that there's these grand, five grand challenges. So how much are you willing to put in? <laughs> yeah. A, a order of magnitude we, uh, is fine, right? We, uh, we actually open to sponsor many of these topics, the, the, the challenge is actually difficult to find people who are willing to do this time for study. Okay. Okay, so, well, so Huawei has lots well, of money. Well, since we're getting uh, in the advertising uh, bank wagon, <laughs> let's just do it. So uh, Bell Labs is really pushing really, really hard. There is a Bell Labs price. I think we're in the third year. Uh, the money is not, uh, you know, uh, overly generous, but 100K grant is maybe to start with. Uh, there is a student price that just happening now, and uh, we're sponsoring universities both in Europe and, and the US. And now with the new Nokia Bell Labs, of course, the, uh, you, there is proof that the real money is being spent, uh, and I think there's more to come. Okay, um, other panelists here? I, I guess, Paulson, maybe we'll, we'll exempt you from this here, but uh, Ali, yeah, Matt. I mean, we, we, of course, at Ericsson, we, we have our own research organization, and we participate in all kinds of EU projects, and we have funding in the U.S., even though we have stuff. So, but I mean, do, do you fund like, uh, like a but few GRAs in the U.S.? I mean, what is the order of funding like in the U.S.? Do you uh, have an idea? For my, under, yeah. you know, for our research group in, in San Jose, I would say the external funding is of the order of a million dollars. Okay. Okay. But this is Not a bad. tiny, tiny part of the, even of the research organization. Okay. And so you imagine funding like what you talked about here. Okay. Yeah, and let me just explode a little bit. I don't get to do this very often, but the new mobile radio research lab is close to 380 people in the new Nokia, and we're recruiting. So real money is being invested in research in physical layer. Okay, excellent. And Matt, do you have any final comments there? I think uh, I think funding a, a grand challenge is a great idea. I mean, we have we don't actually have that format. We're obviously doing a lot of R and D and and university and other funding. We do have some competitions. There's something called Q Prize um, in terms of R and D that's in the billions per year actually total. Um, so, you know, it's very, very important. But I like this idea of funding a, a grand challenge in particular. So thank you for that, and I'll think about that. All right, thank you. Well, thanks, everyone here. Thanks for the panel here. Thank you for attending.